as my style is, if you, uh, you are a mom, would you please stay seated? And for all of you who are not moms, would you please stand and give them a round of applause and a standing ovation? So they truly deserve more than an ovation. There you go. Some of you are still trying to figure out if you're a mom or not. <laughs> what did he mean? What, stand up? Let's see. But it is Happy Mother's Day, and I'm so glad that we have a chance. I know uh, our American culture has a lot of different holidays and celebrations. It seems like we have one uh, just about every week, every month. But uh, this is a big one, and it's very, very important. Go to Luke chapter number one with me. We're going to... Uh, this comes up at different times while preaching through the Gospels, but today I'm going to talk about Jesus and his mother specifically. I really have not uh, done that before in, in terms of just a specific Mother's Day message. I don't always speak on, on Mother's Day or stuff. Hey, I, see, I got you. There you go. Yeah, I got that. I got the control today. But I want to look at just the three different times that Jesus Christ interacted with his mother thoughts on a most interesting relationship there's not a lot to be said uh, excuse me a lot that is said uh, in scripture but of course there could be a lot to be said uh, uh, when it comes to a relationship between a a son and a mom and of course this is the god of glory this is jesus christ and uh, there's nothing wrong with looking at the way jesus interacted with anyone and we know that we can glean something always from the Word of God. And, and really my approach today is to have you just really some thoughts. Maybe even a little bit of an interactive class participation. Get you to kind of think a little bit about, hey, in this particular interaction, what was going on? And uh, what really in that setting brought out the words that were spoken? Oftentimes, when we look to a passage of Scripture, and uh, especially, of course, when it comes to Jesus and the red letters, you see, ah, Jesus said a lot there. Jesus said a lot here. Well, here in this interaction between Jesus and his mother in the three different places we're going to look at, um, there's not a lot there. I'm not going to look at the passage of Scripture that uh, when uh, it is said that the, the people identify that his mother is in, uh, in the neighborhood, is in the uh, crowd, in the company, and, and of course he speaks of who is my mother. And he speaks, of course, spiritually speaking, in context there of, of the relationship that people would have with him. But today I just want to specifically look at some things about Mary and, his, and her son, and of course the son Jesus Christ and her mother a simple statement right off the bat, finding in Luke chapter number one, um, Mary knew who Jesus was to her, and she sang praise unto him. If you're there in Luke chapter number one, and of course you've beat me there, I've got to get over there. Uh, you say, well, you're preaching, you ought to be there already. Well, I was wandering aimlessly through some other passages of scripture, but Luke chapter number one if you are uh, reminded of the context, Mary and Elizabeth, uh, Mary is visiting with Elizabeth, and so, of course, there is this beautiful thing in the Holy Spirit, and, and that uh, uh, the salutation that comes from the baby leaping in Elizabeth and realizing, hey, uh, I know you're pregnant. This is really good. But Mary speaks in verse number 46 and says, uh, and Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. What a great statement. Well, it's part of, in this particular um, passage of Scripture, it's called Magnificent, which means very simply that Mary is magnifying the Lord. She references Abraham at the, near the end of that uh, passage of Scripture. She uh, also, of course, uh, quotes out of Isaiah. She's speaking of this Savior inside of her, verse 48, for he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaid, for behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. 
She is the one that God has chosen. God doesn't make mistakes, and that's absolutely true. But she's telling us something very, very important. She's saying, I need a Savior. Now, if you've grown up in uh, a religious background that teaches a significantly different approach to Mary than the Bible teaches of her, then you would say, well, uh, what if Mary was really regarded very highly beyond just being the one that gave birth to Jesus Christ, but rather that she is deity, that she is someone that can intercede for you on behalf of you for prayers that would go up to heaven. That is a teaching that is out there in another religion and others that tie together to the significance or importance of Mary. But Mary's saying here, how could she possibly be sinless? When she's saying, I need a Savior. Why would you need a Savior if you've never sinned? She rejoiced in Jesus Christ. She says she was called blessed, as I mentioned er earlier, but she's not deity. So we don't want to play down who she is, but we don't want to play up at all who she is. Mary knew who Jesus was to her and sang praises unto him when she visited Elizabeth. It's a really, really beautiful text right there. And you understand her heart is giving glory and exalting and extolling the Lord God Almighty. Also with Mary, something that you could find in Matthew chapter number, 20, uh, chapter number 2. Go to Matthew 2 for a moment real quick up on the screen. It says simply this, that Mary witnessed the worship of Christ by the wise men when they saw the child. So Mary worshipped her child as Savior and praised him for who he is, but she also witnessed others. She said, I know all that, but let's just focus in on Mary. Focus in on Jesus Christ and see really simply this. Before we get into their interaction, when they're a little bit older than him being just a baby, that Mary witnessed the worship of Christ. So she has the baby, Jesus, in her. She is pregnant with Jesus Christ. And now after Jesus is around two years old, in Matthew chapter number two, we realize that he is being worshipped. It says in verse number 11, when they, and when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. This is the house in Nazareth. They are not in Bethlehem. They're not in where the, the baby, the, that Jesus Christ is um, in, a, in a manger, in a, in a barn. He is not there. He is at home. He's two years old, or even maybe more. And, of course, the king of the time. Who's looking for him? Herod. And he wants to worship him, as he says in verse number 8. But we know better than that. He wants to stop the worship of Jesus Christ by taking his life. It is seen right there in that text, in verse number 9, that they heard the king, they departed, lo, the star which saw in the east. They were going after this. They were looking for this young child. And when they saw the star, that they rejoiced in exceeding great joy. And so when they came in to the house, Mary witnesses their heart is full. Of course, they brought treasures. They presented the gold and frankincense, myrrh. Now, we know that Jesus Christ at this time is two -ish years old, as I mentioned. Now, I've never really heard a message. I think you need to do this one. What does a terrible two-year-old do with gold, frankincense, and myrrh? <laughs> Throw it all over the house? Play with it? Really? Yeah. Eat it? If you could. It's not hot dogs. No. You think about this setting. This is a child who is not a baby. A young child. Older baby. And this worship of him is witnessed by Mary. And you're saying, okay, yeah, that's, that's duh, you know. Again, Mary knew. Mary witnessed. Mary herself. But I just today don't want to, let's just talk about Mother's Day and exalt her as a mom. I want to have you kind of look at Jesus and his mother and their interaction. So go to Luke chapter number 2. And let's look at their first interaction. At this particular place, we see in Luke chapter number 2, 
Now, Jesus is a child, but he's an older child now. We're going to use, as it says up on the screen, verses 48 through 52. So we're not going to take a deep dive into the passage, but consider this, again, in the context, as you are kind of understanding this, and it's not just Christmas story time, but rather Mary, Joseph, interacting with their child. It's been going on for 12 years, okay? This is not, again, the little baby or... This is a boy at 12 years old in the Jewish culture, maybe getting ready to be married. He might be at a place where two families are coming together and trying to figure out over the next year or two or three, as a young adult, who are you going to marry? And what type of culture this is set up for is that there would be the continual generation of, generational unfolding of the Hebrew, the Jewish nation, and all that they would do so. He is not someone that's regarded as, hey, go in the backyard and play ball all the time. In fact, we know the setting. Because if a family really believed in the Jewish religion, they were truly followers of the Old Covenant, then there would be three feasts that everybody who's a believer would come to Jerusalem for, and this particular time is the Passover. If there was one that they would try and choose, if they didn't have the monies to travel for all of them, it would be, let's get to Jerusalem for the Passover. So this is the Passover time. And again, verse number 42 for context, when the twelve, when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast, so that's where they're sitting. That's where the, this is all set up. Remember now, of course, they leave to go back with their people. They realize after a day that their son is missing. They take another day to travel back, and then they take another day to try and find him in Jerusalem. So we really get to a point where we pick it up in verse number 48. The parents, of course, are very worried. Verse 48. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How was it, excuse me, how is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. Please understand what I showed you early in just a couple of verses is not a conflict. Mary knows who he is, but what he has just said, they did not understand. So they have to have it understood to them. They have to have it explained to them. And that's going to be something that will unfold over the next number of months in Jesus' ministry. Verse 51 and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. A lot of wisdom for a mom. Well, let me bring things up. I need to talk over it. It says she kept them to her heart. Verse 52 tells us something about Jesus. Great passage, great verse. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. So consider this. Jesus and his mother, they are in a place of interacting. They're going to have this time together right here in this setting. He's 12 years old. Now, you're a mom. Your 12-year-old son is missing. Maybe for some of you, you're going, yay! No, I know, you're looking for your son. You're looking for your daughter. You're concerned. You're worried. So uh, help me here. Answer for me this. As you're thinking through this and they're having an interaction with one another, Jesus is finally found in the temple. What do you think, beyond the fact that says they're amazed, what do you think their interaction is setting up to be like? Anybody? Any thoughts? What's their interaction setting up to be like? Yes. So, I'm relieved. We found him. Whew. Okay, that's one side of it. What else? Oh. Are you in trouble now? A lot of you parents are like that, huh? Some of you are relieved. You find out he's not hurt, and then you go, now you're in trouble. 
Oh, Mom, Dad, I'm hurting. I fell. I, uh, are you feeling okay? Are you going to be okay? Yeah, I'm going to be okay. Okay, wham, 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 wham. No, 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 no. What else about their interaction? Tell me. What's going to go on here? What's going on here? Yes. How did you miss me for three days? How is it? Thanks, Mom and Dad. I'm going to go get another family. Which, by the way, he does have someone that's watching over him. How did Jesus Christ respond to his mother after he stayed behind in the temple and was found three days later? How would you read how he responds? I didn't say what he said. How do you read what... His response is, how did he respond to his mom? Yes. You should have known. Why didn't you know? Besides the fact that you lost track of me, you should know. So that's one of the things. What else? What else is going on? Yes. You should know why I'm here at the temple still and I'm not somewhere else. What else? What else? Yes. Why are you worrying about me? Yes. Amen. You knew this, didn't you? So predictable. <laughs> Must be the Holy Spirit. Think about this junior high student. Junior, now track, junior high student right now. How many of you coach soccer for 11-year-olds, 10, 11, 12-year-olds? Yeah? Yeah? This is one of your kids in soccer. Holds Evie. I know. What would it be like if you as a parent had your kid come home late and you were really mad at them and they say, Mom, Mom, I, I'm sorry I lost track of time, but I was up the street with my friend, my neighbor, and I've been talking to them about Jesus Christ and how they could get saved. Whoa, wouldn't that be awesome? The junior high age student, the child Jesus, still called a child, was about to be into adulthood and what he did is he was wise in how he spoke. When they found him, he was about his father's business. Sarcastic, nasty, mean, absolutely not. He goes, very simply, at 12 years old, I know he's God, I got this, but he's son of man and son of God. And he's all flesh and he speaks with reverence. Consider this, he has deep respect, deep, deep respect for his parents. And they, as mom and dad, in the picture, because it's father and I, which we know she's not, you know, some people want to say, well, let's use that scripture to prove that they were the father and mother and parents. No, yeah, that, that's a big stretch. You're not going to get that one. But she's saying in the context, hey, father and I have sought the sorrowing. And he immediately goes to the most important thing he could say, hey, I am about my father's business. I'm at the temple. I'm tracking things with these rabbis, with the rabbinical priesthood. I'm talking to the chief mucky mucks of the religion. I am looking to them. And it says there in verse 47, all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. But the verse 46 before that says, he was hearing them and asking them questions. Just remember the textual context of what is going on here. In the text, this man, whose child Jesus, about the father's business, is interacting with the wisest, most religious, most comprehensive doctorate, master's divinity, theological uh, uh, backgrounds of the people of the old covenant and they marvel and they're astonished at him 
He comes off of that and goes, oh, you know, you're the greatest. And he still is humble in his wisdom when he speaks to his mother and father. So let me put it to you. What's your interaction like with your mother and father? And what is our children's interaction with their mother and father? Because there's deep respect in their relationship. And you can deduce it when you read the words of Jesus spoken to his mother. Why do I go that far with that? Because I mentioned it and highlighted it. She did not come back after him. She did not come back and attack him. She did not come and pick apart anything he said. It says that she held these things. It says that his mother kept all these sayings in her how often times do we nag and we pick and we go after something? I'm not talking about letting a child get away with a lie. That's not what I'm speaking about. I'm speaking about a child given a specific truth and it's all done. They've given you deep respect for what they have answered. And yet we will not keep the things in our heart about what they've just said to us. As parents, we need to have a deeper respect for our children. And the other side, of course, is very true. That our children ought to have a deep respect when they speak to their parents. It's amazing how as we get a little bit older that we expect to be treated with respect because we've had children. Or for coaching, we don't have children, we haven't raised kids yet. We're, we're maybe just sitting on the sidelines wondering if God would give us children or not, if we're going to have kids or not. And we wonder, okay, but in the meantime, as Pastor Pesky preached about it last week, as raising children, training up children, our whole church together as a church family can come alongside of parents if you don't have kids and allow them to become healthier and better at raising their children so all of us in this how important is deep respect in relationship on both sides jesus and his mother are revealing this to us simple illustration my mom in june it'll be 35 years she's been gone she obviously died at a very young age. I'd love to have a talk with my mom. But here's the thing is I think about those type of things, and it's not just today on Mother's Day. There's many times where I'm brought to tears over the way I treated my mother as the years went on. I thought I was so much better that I would disrespect her. I would talk to her poorly. I would cuss at her. I would say bad things to her. I wonder where it is and where it goes wrong that we as adults sense that it's okay to disrespect our parents and dishonor them and treat them so poorly. You say, well, it's all their fault. Well, how is it that we get older and treat our children worse than we ought to? I wonder with Jesus' modeling how to have deep respect and relationship that maybe we can't grasp a little bit as we look at some thoughts on Jesus and his mother. The second one I want you to look at, go over to John's gospel if you wouldn't mind. John chapter number two. You know where I'm going there. As we have the first words in scripture that are spoken of, now this is Jesus' first miracle. You say, yeah, I got that, I know. Okay, we're just going to go over that text. And, and obviously, since Jesus called his mother woman, I can do the same thing to my... Oh, don't do that. But understand, in the context of the time, he was addressing her politely. It is a polite direction to say woman, but in a way in which it wasn't degrading. The word woman of man. So, very simply... He's using his father's terminology, woman, as he addresses his mother. Let's look at the text. John chapter number 2, let's read verses 1 through 5. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now keep in context real quick, for you to be at a wedding, you'd have to have an invitation. Okay? Verse number two tells me, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. So that means that through his mother or somehow, if not specific, he was called. Also the disciples that are hanging out with him. It's not specific though which disciples it is. 
Okay? We can suppose that there are certain ones there, but it says his disciples. Whomever they are, disciple, a learner, a willing learner, someone who's wanting to be around Jesus. So it says his disciples. Many preachers read into a lot of stuff. I see the text. This is what the text says. This is what we deduce. Verse 3. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. So real quick, you're thinking, why are you saying something to Jesus? Verse number 4. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Wow. Powerful statement here. Verse 5. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Do it. So what are your thoughts here? They're interacting again. There's some interaction. Here's the thoughts that we would look at when it comes to Jesus and his mother interacting over the wedding feast. They're there. Not by happenstance, not by accident. Mary's there. It says that Jesus is called and his disciples. And so they're interacting. This is the site of Christ's first miracle. Interesting. Now just, we're, we're going to end up in John 19. You know there's an interaction. There's no other interactions. Consider their interactions. As a child at 12 in the first words of Scripture uh, record... The second interaction, the first time that Jesus Christ does a miracle, the third, at the cross. That dog will hunt right there. The depth of the theology and the deity of Christ and the divinity of what he is bringing to us in just these three meetings is absolutely overwhelming. There's so much here in their interaction over these three instances, and you know this isn't a coincidence. So what do you think about this? I I, I just said something a minute ago about, you know, one of the things about their interaction is that, I mean, you know, why is is she getting him involved? That's one. But what do you see in their interaction here? What do you see that could be going on? What are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on their interaction real quick? Anybody? Yes, Ben. So she knows who he is. So is that maybe what you, why she's coming to him? Okay. Okay. What else? What else do you see here? Yes. He, you're saying, hey, she's anxious for people to know who he is. She knows who he is. She's anxious for everybody else to know. What else? What else do you think here? About, just think some thoughts about this. Put yourself in there. You guys don't do that, do you, where you get the setting? Go ahead, Tyler. Please do something. Amen. How long does a wedding last back then? Seven. Seven days for sure, sometimes eight. There's no way that they can run out of the wine that they're having together. There's no way. And so Mary, in her presumption of what he could do, now he comes back to her and says, what do you presume that I could do? Do you want me to ward off a family war? What a great way to start off. Two 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 families in the marriage... Right? It's kind of like Adam, you and... I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Everything, everything you see is beautiful. Just think about, real quick, in this setting, what could happen in this wedding. If two families are so upset, they're all embarrassed because there's not enough to have the feast, the celebration. What could it be like? I ask you something coming off of this. Why did Jesus speak to his mother in this manner? And Tyler spoke a little bit about it, but why did Jesus speak with his mother in this manner that he did in the marriage feast 
at Cana. Go ahead. Say it. Amen. Amen. Jesus, in the part of the revelation of who he is, is revealing to others who he is himself. What does he say in that statement there? My hour. The hour. Mine hour is not yet come. He's revealing to them, though they may not capture it, that the hour that I'm referring to is the cross, the redemption, the blood that will be shed. So, in this whole setting and what's going on here, we know, hey, as a guest and the guest, he's the son of man. He's been invited to a wedding. You're invited to a wedding. But as the Son of God, he says, mine hour is not yet come. Right in that place, he's revealing something powerful. He's letting mom know, and all of them around, but especially mom, because he's talking to her directly. Mother, you know who I am. But the reality of why I came has not hit you yet. I am the Savior that you prayed for. And he responded to his mother as the Son of God. This, to me, beyond his first interaction of having this incredible, deep honesty, he has this trans, excuse me, this, this uh, what did I say there? Well, you'll get seen on someday, too. When he has this incredible ability to have authentic honesty here, that he is saying, look, Mom, I want to really tell you the truth. Brian jokes around a little bit. Uh, To be honest with you, that's really what this is. It's not just giving the fact or the truth about what he is doing, but it's the transparency with which he's speaking. Consider this. The world wants you to just say, hey, Jesus' first miracle, I heard, he just, he told everybody they could get drunk. He turned water into wine. Okay. Do you really know what's going on here, everybody? Do you really know that this wine and his miracle are the typifying statement of the hour that will come? He's typifying this beautiful picture of changing water into this new wine, which is his blood. He is saying, look, when I come, I came for a purpose to shed my blood You may think that he's being insensitive to his mother, but he's not. He's speaking truth here, and he's saying, mine hour is not yet come. His mother says, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. So she releases again this thought process of, I'm going to hold him just to what he's going to do. I want you to serve him, because now I realize this is going to be an important moment. When Jesus says, hey, everybody, servants, Grab these six containers, these water pots, fill them up, and I'm going to do something that you are just going to be blown away with. This transparent honesty was spoken by Jesus, and it pointed to his divinity. It really did. He said, look, my blood's going to be shed for the sins of all mankind. I have divinity from my Father, and I am going to be crucified on a cross for you, my mother. The mother that said when he was in her womb, my Savior, my Savior. Now I ask you, is your relationship with your parent, spiritually speaking, your father believer, a place of transparency, a place of transparent honesty. Well, God, I told you what I did, and I confess and admit it. Well, hey, we had our break time yesterday in Happy Five Soccer, and it talked about forgiveness. God, forgive me. I need to forgive others. 
How is it that oftentimes in our just saying the facts, we're not transparent? What's the transparency about my heart behind it? Am I completely honest with you and not just giving you a rendition of what happened? For Jesus Christ right here, he's transparently honest about everything he's saying and he's saying it to his mother and he's saying woman what have i to do with thee mine hour is not yet come but she has asked him hey they have no wine you need to do something about this i know i'm reading into a little bit so let's just say this jesus i'm coming to you there's a problem can you deal with it i wonder when those days have come to a close where your children don't come to you for any type of help or any type of solution. They get older and they've got everything all taken care of and then they come to you in an absolute mess and they tell you they need help, they need help and they won't tell you everything that's going on. You ask a question or two, you say, well, let's just go to the Lord and pray about it. Let's go to the Lord and see what he will do. And we point everybody to the Lord we point everybody that we know as our children and say, we need God to be involved in this. What would it be like if our relationships and our parents were like that? If you look up statistics of the way that children are treating parents, the way parents are treating children, there's so many broken families. There's so many places where I see, and again, this, these statistics are, are glaringly difficult to read how children are treating their grown-up parents as they become grown-ups. How children are standing up against their parents and fighting against them physically. How they are rejecting their counsel and their, their, uh, their position of them for them and as a parent. I wonder today if in looking at Jesus Christ and the way that he handled his relationship with his mother, if we can't glean some thought and go, wow, Jesus Christ is churning water into wine. It typifies this pure, perfect miracle of his blood in the Lord Jesus Christ. How could Jesus ever pervert that? Oh, you can give yourself power, give power over to someone else or something else. My gosh, to take and look at this beautiful first miracle and have the world twist it is awful. Verse number 11 pulls it all together. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Canaan of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Do we really see in Jesus and his mother and their interaction the beauty of this transparent honesty in relationships is your relationship with Holy Father in heaven, believer, transparent, transparent and honest. Is it? Or do you keep things back with, from God? Oh, God knows everything, so I don't have to talk about it. That's not what Psalm 51 is all about. When David speaks to the God of the universe, the third one, Jesus and his mother. The crucifixion of Christ. Go to John chapter number 19. And I'll pull this all together and finish up. John chapter number 19. We know there's seven statements for Jesus from the cross. And in John chapter number 19, we see two powerful ones. Of course, we also see a third one when it comes to it is finished. Think about this right here, right now. Jesus and his mother. Chapter number 19, verse number 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. Think for a moment in verse 25 that it says Jesus is on the cross, and the accounting is that his mother stands. She's standing not laying, not sitting. She's standing by the cross. Where are all the disciples? We know one's here. Verse number 26, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, woman, behold thy son. 
verse 27. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. What a powerful statement. Wow. Let me read verse 28, 9, and 30 if you will indulge me. Is part of just this setting here. After this, he has spoken. Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Verse number 29. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and it put upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. Verse 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. What a setting. What are your thoughts on their interaction? I'll just have you think about it for a moment. I think to myself and their thoughts of interaction and what's going on here at the cross when Jesus Christ ordained a new relationship for her. What is it that's going on here? What is the, the deep-rooted pieces and parts? What, what is the meaning behind all of this? Why is it that of all the things that could happen, all the things that could be spoken, and we know it is finished, he gave up the coast, forgive them, they know not what they do. Speaking to the man, the two men that are on his right and is on his left, there are things that are spoken from the cross, but here we have, in this setting, Jesus Christ with compassion beyond any human to me, that you could recognize. What was the deep meaning behind Jesus' last words from the cross to his mother? What's there? What's going on there? What has happened here in this setting? Jesus and his mother, their relationship. We have very little interaction here. We have very little words back and forth. You know that Mary was around at different times and accountings, but Aren't you pulled back to this idea that at this point Jesus Christ is showing everything that a son ought to be. Everything that a child ought to be for their parent. Everything in the Lord Jesus Christ for compassion that we ought to be as believers. I'd love to hear more stories of this. As your parent is getting older, but you're younger, and maybe a sickness gets stricken to you, maybe a situation where you know you know that you can't go on or someone is set with a malady in their 30s and 40s and they can't care for their parents. What are you going to do to make arrangements for your parent to be cared for? I know it's always the other side. I hope my parents can help me out when I'm 30, 40 years old and I got grandchildren and I'm running out of cash. I know. But here's the deep meaning behind Jesus' last words. After his years of ministry... 33 years old, and he turns to his mother and he says, I have compassion on you. I want you to be cared for. I want you to know that in this final moment, in this final moment, stood by the cross his mother, and then he says, I've got you. John, your mother. Is it too much for us to take care of our parents? You say with a financial situation in the world system that appears both, both people and with you got your kids and everything going on, we have to take care of a parent. I don't know if I can do it. Now I've got all these hospital bills for myself. I don't know if I can do it. Do we prepare for these type of moments? Do we have the compassion? You see, authentic love was displayed as the Son of God spoke compassionate words from the cross. Authentic love, real, deep, strong love, it was displayed as the Son of God spoke compassionate words from the cross to his mother. Do you speak those kind of words to your parents that are still around you? As parents, do you hear those words from your children? The story may be too common that 
Yes, I have a parent that lives in the area, but I haven't talked to her. I haven't talked to him in years. It's kind of scary to think that Jesus Christ, the God of the universe, looks down from the cross where his blood is being shed and his hour has come and he knows exactly what his mother needs and he's going to make sure it's provided for. And John is spoken to in the statement again that resonates from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home to take care of her. Compassion? Are my words compassionate? Compassion? Are my actions compassionate? Will I be in that place one day where my ability to care for my parents is not the way it ought to be and I could have somebody take care of or put some things in trust to be taken care of? I wonder if we just say basically because we have this American cultural system that we just grab a hold of what we got, we eat, drink, and be merry, we just blow all of our money, or we blow all our resources, and we're not capable of doing anything for our parents. Or we're still looking for our parents to take care of us. When it says that Mary stood by the cross of Jesus Christ and watched him suffer while there was no other disciples there, but John. Would it have made a difference if others were there? That's not for me to decide. But I understand this setting right here. When I look at the authentic love that Jesus Christ had, when I look at his incredible, compassionate words, when I look at how he's so honest about the way things are, he's transparent in his honesty toward his mother, that he says, hey, mother, <laughs> I'm here for a reason, and my hour hasn't quite come. Let me just tell it to you straight. But when he says to his mother and father that he's about his father's business, you can't ask for anything stronger when he says, look, I give you respect, I give you honor, and I give you love. If there's ever three things that you ought to give to your parents, and you ought to pass on to your children to give to you, it ought to be those three. That you respect, honor, Similarly spoken. That you tell the truth, but you're transparent in your honesty by pouring out your heart in a good way, in the right way. And then at the end of the day saying, you know what? My love for you is so authentic. It's so real. That I will do all I can to care for you. You have a world that contradicts that, that counters that. But it's always been that way. Jesus' way with his mother gives us the model of how to care for our parents, to care for one another, and for parents to care for their children. I ask you today on this Mother's Day this simple question. It's up on the screen. Would it be right just to simply evaluate your relationship with God and others? It starts with salvation. Are you born again today? Have you ever called in the name of the Lord to save you? Have you ever authentically loved others the way that he has taught us to love believers? If you're lost today, then having that kind of love, that agape love, that charity type of love, is just impossible without Jesus Christ. The Bible said, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. When you get saved, you received this incredible, above all the blessings, you received a new father, 
a new parent, the only parent that you ever need. But he's modeled parenting to you. And Jesus Christ modeled sonhood to you and me. The other half of this is this. Is there something that needs to be spoken today? Maybe on a Mother's Day, there's something that has to be acknowledged. Maybe there's something that needs to be reconciled. Maybe in your relationships with people, maybe with a parent, a grandparent, maybe there's something that needs to be acknowledged and spoken about. I know that there are some tough relationships, but maybe today, looking at the thoughts of Jesus Christ and thinking through his interaction with his mother, maybe you can glean something off of that and say, you know what? I'm going to give authentic love. I really am. I'm going to be more thankful. I'm going to give respect. And I'm going to give honesty in a way that is so transparent that it frees my soul to have a better relationship with those that I love. As we go into this time of invitation, I'd ask you, I'm going to pray for you. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And as you're doing that, let me just ask something one more time. Is there something today that needs to be spoken, acknowledged and reconciled with someone? Or maybe with you and God. Maybe today is the day that that happens. Father in heaven, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for allowing us to gather together in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the example of Jesus and his mother. Thank you for how we can see how important respect and honesty and love really are, and they were shown by the Lord Jesus Christ. This isn't a complicated message, and yet it brings a lot of thoughts. So I pray by the power of your word, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, that you will stir us to respond. I thank you for your people, God's people, and I pray that you will work in this invitation time, this time of prayer, in Jesus' name. Please stand if you would.